In the 1950s and 60s, a man by the name of Elwin Wilson was a member of the KKK. He was known throughout the South for his violence against black people. Uh, He was known to participate in mobs that would beat on and attack black people. He was known to throw blunt objects at them as they walked down the street. In fact, this is a photo um, of a mob that's attacking two black men who were protesting for their civil rights. And you'll see, it's kind of difficult to see, but up here in the kind of the center right, that's Elwin Wilson. He's got a smile on his face, his hair slicked back. He's wearing a, a football jersey if it's hard for you to see, but... Um, he was participating in a mob attack of these two black men. They were throwing raw eggs at them as they were protesting for their civil rights. Elwin was known to, uh, for scare tactics. He would set burning crosses. Now think about the cross, the symbol of Christ and redemption. And he had distorted it with the KKK and was using that as a scare tactic to scare black families out of the neighborhood. He was so hateful towards black people that he wanted to make sure anybody who passed by his home uh, knew what he believed about race. And so he took a little black baby doll and hung it from a limb of a tree by a noose at the end of his driveway so that anybody who passed his house knew how he felt about black people. This man hated them. And on May 9th, 1961, his entire world was about to change. The Freedom Riders were coming into Rock Hill, South Carolina bus station, May 9th, 1961. If you don't know what a Freedom Rider is, they were activists, both men and women, black and white, who were protesting uh, the segregation of the South. And the Freedom Riders rode into Rock Hill, South Carolina on a bus. And a man by the name of John Lewis, this is John here. Uh, This is his mugshot after he was arrested for using a whites only bathroom. John Lewis was a freedom writer. He worked closely with Martin Luther King and he steps off the bus at Rock Hill, South Carolina. And uh, Elwin Wilson meets him as John enters into a whites only waiting room and begins to repeatedly beat and pummel John. Now, John was trained in nonviolent resistance and, uh, and, and he was a Christian. He was a follower of Jesus. In fact, he was going to American Baptist Theological Seminary to become a Baptist preacher. And as he's laying there on the ground, being beaten and bloodied, he said, I had an executive meeting with myself. I knew it wasn't enough to just not fight back. I knew that I needed to actively love this man while he was actively hating me. Actively love the man who is beating and bloodying me. And while uh, once Elwin kind of finished the job, felt like he had sufficiently beat John, a police officer came up to John and said, I saw what happened. Would you like to uh, press charges? We can bring him to jail and prosecute. And John said, no. I haven't come here to cause problems and I don't want him to be defined by this for the rest of his life with charges. I've come here in love. And that statement bothered Elwin Wilson for the next several decades. How could a man choose to love me when I hated him? And that rang out in his mind. Ultimately, it was a part of what brought him to faith in Christ. He repented of his sins, turned from his racist ways, placed his faith in Jesus. And he began praying, God, please provide an opportunity for me to apologize to the man I brutalized in the bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina in 1961. And 48 years after that day, he got that opportunity. See, Elwin Wilson found out that John Lewis had become a congressman and he shows up in his office, sets up an appointment, shows up in his office and he says, you don't know me, but I'm the man who beat you May 9th, 1961 in the Rock Hill, South Carolina bus station. Will you please forgive me? Now think about the context of this situation. They're brothers in Christ now. They're both followers of Jesus and a great evil was done a great sin against John. 
And here Elwin comes with tears asking for forgiveness. What would your response be? How would you engage with the man who beat you in this moment? Today, we're going to continue our series through one another. And we're actually going to finish up this series. And I'm going to put a pause on this story. We're going to come back to it. And I'll tell you the conclusion of it. But I want us to be challenged by this picture of a black man actively loving somebody who was his enemy. We're going to be looking at the book of John. And as Jesus commands us to love one another. So we're going to be in John chapter 13, starting in verse 31. And before we jump into the passage, I want to give us the context to make sure we know uh, what was going on in the passage prior to this. So Jesus, he sat down with his disciples for the Passover, the supper uh, that they, he had anticipated and been looking forward to with his disciples. And in the midst of the Passover meal, Jesus gets up, he puts a towel around his waist, and he begins washing the feet of the disciples, teaching them that this is what love looks like. This is what greatness looks like. It's humility and servanthood. And I love the language that John uses there. He says, and Jesus loved them even to the very end. Jesus was about living a life of sacrificial love. And in the midst of this very relational and private environment, Jesus drops a couple of uh, bombs. He, things that kind of just confound the disciples. Firstly, he says, look, one of you is going to betray me. And I think in that moment, all the disciples are like, who in the world? What, what do you mean we're going to betray you? We've been with you through thick and thin, Jesus. No way. Couldn't be one of us. They certainly didn't suspect anybody. They were so confused. And then John, the one who calls himself the beloved disciple, the guy who wrote the passage we're reading today, leans into Jesus and he says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus dips a morsel of bread in and hands it to the one who is going to betray him, Judas Iscariot. At that moment, Satan enters into Judas and Judas exits the building as Jesus tells him what you're going to do, do quickly. So that's the context of the passage we're in today. When he had gone out, that he right there is Judas. When Judas had gone out, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Over and over and over again, the refrain is glorified, glorified, glory, glory. Jesus is looking, and we're going to do some work on this. I don't want to dive too deep into it until we get the full passage here. But Jesus is looking at the cascading series of events that are about to take place as Judas leaves the building. And he says, now my glory will be revealed. Continuing on, he says in verse 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. He uses this, uh, this language of little children at the beginning of verse 33. That word in the original language is technion. It's actually exclusive to the apostle John. He uses it in the gospel. He also uses it later in his epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. So uh, it's exclusive to him, but this is not Jesus belittling the disciples for being childish. Like, come on guys, grow up. You're being childish. That's not what this word means. It is a term of endearment. Another rendering of it could be darlings. Darlings. It's this term of endearment that speaks of how precious these men are to Jesus. Then he says, little children, listen to me. I'm leaving. I just pause there. Put yourself in their shoes. You've been following Jesus around for three years. You've left much to follow him. What would you feel? Like what emotions? What turmoil would be going on inside your heart and mind as you hear that Jesus isn't just leaving, but you cannot follow him. And he says, as I'm leaving, I want to, I want to teach you what it looks like to live continually after I leave this place. Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That is a hard teaching. Look at the language there. Just as I have loved you. That's hard. How did Jesus love? Perfectly. 
unconditionally, without sin. Jesus loved perfectly. Then he says, I want you to love one another in the same manner that I have loved you. And then verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, if you have love for one another, people will know. So we're just going to comb back through. We're only going to hang out in these four verses. We're going to comb back through and just pull out some things about love that the Lord is saying in here. Firstly, he talks about his glorious suffering, his glorious suffering. Let's look at it here. When he had gone out. So it starts out with the recognition that Judas has just peaced out. He's out of there. And I wanted to go back to a couple of those verses from prior uh, to verse 31 to get us some context. So Jesus, he's sitting down at the table with his disciples. And here's what happens. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit, verse 21, and testified, truly, truly. Now, anytime you see truly, truly, or some translations say, verily, verily, I just want you to imagine Jesus just grabbing your face and saying, listen, this is what he's doing to his disciples. Listen, this is important because you're not going to believe this. And we see this on the other side of this statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And all the disciples are like, what? No, we won't. Jesus, we've been with you through thick, thin, joys, sorrows, triumphs, and difficulties. We are in it. We're not going to betray you. And Jesus says, truly, truly, listen, this is going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed. Now we know that uh, from verse two in this passage, that the devil has already prompted Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus to the chief priests and elders for 30 pieces of silver. He's going to sell out his rabbi for money. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And there's confusion at the table. And then John leans in and says, Rabbi, who? Who, who is it going to be? And he says, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. That's so dark. This is demonic possession. Judas is now under the control of Satan. Satan entered into him. Such a hope, hopeless statement. Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. What I think is so powerful about Jesus' statement here, what you're going to do, do quickly, is that Jesus is not unaware of what Satan and Judas are about to do. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. He knows that this will lead to a series of cascading events, ultimately culminating in his death on the cross. Jesus is fully aware of this situation. He's in control. He tells Satan in Judas, what you're about to do, go do it quickly. Jesus knew what was about to happen and willingly stayed the course because he loves you. So how is it that Jesus can know all of this, that he's going to be betrayed by his friends, that ultimately all the disciples will scatter and abandon him, that he'll be arrested by the people he came to save, that he'll be brought through mock trials and false allegations will be brought against him, that he'll be beaten with a cat of nine tails, that they'll say, crucify him. And the very people he came to save will shout, crucif crucify him that he will be beaten with rods, his, beards will be ripped out. his beard will be ripped out, he'll be spat on, publicly humiliated, stripped naked, and eventually pierced and hung on a cross to die. And I think in our culture, we don't really understand the, the ugliness of the cross because we kind of put it on walls in our house. I got one in my house, we, or we have it on a necklace, and I'm not against that at all. I think it's a beautiful reminder of Jesus, but it's the same thing as putting a cute little decoration of an electric chair on the wall. This was a torturous killing device. And so here he looks towards all of this that's coming. And what does he say about it? Now is the son of man glorified. How can Jesus look towards the cross and his suffering and say it's glory. And if you don't know what glory is for the sake of our conversation today, it is a weighty term, has a robust definition, but we can say ultimately in this passage, Jesus is talking about the display of his beauty as his glory. How is his beauty going to be displayed as he's humiliated and beaten and bloodied? 
How is the cross beautiful? How is the cross his glory? It's because the cross is the space where a loving God meets sinners like you and I in our deepest need. The cross is the place where a loving God meets sinners like you and I in our deepest need. And we have a very real need. Sin to be dealt with. You see, we have a a great enemy called sin. Your greatest enemy is not the difficulties in your marriage or your finances or the ladder you have to climb at work or your parenting issues. Your greatest enemy is not your health. Your greatest enemy is not even Satan. Your greatest enemy is sin because sin is the only thing that separates you from the love of God or the only thing that separates separates you from God. God loves everybody. But sin is the only thing that separates you from God. And so it is a great enemy because it separates you from the greatest treasure of the universe. And here, Jesus willingly stays the course to deal with our sin. Because it wasn't just the the physical reality and the pain that Jesus experienced. The reality is Jesus, there was a spiritual reality going on there as well. As Jesus went upon the cross, he took our sin, past, present, future sin of everybody in history upon himself. And the wrath of God, God's righteous anger towards our sin was poured out on Jesus. Jesus willingly did this out of love for us that we might be redeemed but he didn't stay dead. After he gave up his spirit, three days later, he rose from the grave, confirming who he said he was all along, conquering death, conquering Satan, and conquering our great enemy, sin, once and for all. Jesus can call the cross glory because he overcame all of the obstacles that were in the way of us being in relationship with God, namely sin. This is a beautiful picture of God's love for you. And all throughout this series, we've been talking about if we're called to love one another, we can't do that by ourselves. We must first experience the love of God. We must first receive the love of God because the type of love God has commanded us to love each other with is agape love, unconditional, affectionate desire for someone's best that leads to self-sacrificial action. That's how we've defined that. We don't have access to that type of love apart from Jesus. And so I want to ask you, as Jesus says, the cross is my glory because it's the place where my love meets your deepest need. Have you internalized this for yourself? Have you brought this into your own personal life? It's easy to kind of skirt around experiencing God's love by by just saying, well, God loves the world or, or God loves everybody. And that's true. True statements. But what's also true is God loves you personally and individually. He loves you with your mistakes and your failures and your history and your sin. He loves you. And the glory of the cross is he died in your place. He died in my place. I deserve the wrath of God. I deserve eternal separation. He died in my place. And that's why the cross is so glorious. So have you internalized this? Are you experiencing the love of God? You see, far too often, I think we, we, we study the love of God and, and, and we study the scriptures, but we're not experiencing it. And listen to me, I love getting nitty gritty and nerdy with the Bible. Okay. I'm all for studying, but I fully believe this next statement. A theology of God's love that does not lead to an experience of God's love is useless. You aren't supposed to just intellectually know about God's love. God is a person. He's a person to be experienced and he wants you to live, exist and receive his love. He wants you to experience it. So are you experiencing it? If you're not, the rest of what we have to talk about today is going to be impossible for you to do. The cross is glory because it's the love of God revealed for sinful humanity. But if you're not experiencing that in your own life, you will never be able to live out the commandment of Jesus in this passage. So I want to challenge you. Are you experiencing it? At the beginning of the series, we gave a couple ideas of how you can implement uh, some relational rhythms uh, with God so that you can experience his love. 
He's always showering you with love. Just oftentimes we aren't aware and we aren't present to it. So I want to give you two ideas. And these are ideas that the staff uh, at Family Church has been uh, speaking, to, uh, uh, encouraged rather, to, uh, to process as well. Two ideas. Number one, are you existing in daily time with the Lord? Daily time in relationship with him. Now that can look like Bible study and, and the Bible is the authoritative word of God. It is how God has chosen to reveal himself. It should be a major part of our spiritual life. But it's not the only way to experience God in a daily time. We were talking about this on the staff and Pam Alden, the, the administrator in South Umpqua said, man, I just feel connected to God when I ride horses. And I'm like, good for you. I don't. I'm terrified of horses. I feel like when I'm on a horse, I feel like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is giving me a piggyback ride. It's terrifying. Okay. But she feels connection and communion to God as she rides out in the mountains. Thank you, God, for the beauty of your creation. Thank you for these horses. And it connects her heart to his. Daily connection to God. Cultivate things that help you connect to Jesus. And the second one is a, is a weekly Sabbath. So daily time with God in a weekly Sabbath. Now, when I say Sabbath, I know for some of us that raises alarms. Like, oh no, uh, is this a legalistic checklist? Uh, uh, that I know in the Old Testament they were commanded to do so, but does that cross over to today? And I'm, I'm not saying that this is a command. I'm not saying that this is, a, this is a, a, a legalistic thing you have to do to earn God's favor or grace or love. God loves you unconditionally, whether you Sabbath or not. I'm saying this is a gift from God where he says, I want you to just cease from working and delight in me. Take a day, a week, a day every week where you cease from working to delight in the Lord. This means we don't answer the emails and we don't mow the lawn and we don't do the dishes and we don't do the work and we just rest and delight. God, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for my family. I'm going to enjoy them today. Thank you for your creation. I'm going to enjoy it in a hike today. But whatever it looks like for you, Sabbath can look, like, can look different for each of us. It's ceasing from work to delight in God. That's not legalism. That's relationship. And that is a gift for you. So I want to challenge you with those two. Daily time with God and a weekly Sabbath ways that you can put yourself into continuous connection with Jesus that you might be experiencing his love. The second thing I want us to see in this passage is we are called to love as he loved. We're called to love as he loved. Now that's a big ask. Let's look at, let's look at it. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Think about what this meant to the dudes who were listening to him in the first place. The disciples. This means Peter and John, get over yourselves and love each other. Peter and John seem to have some competition. As John tells the story of them going to Jesus' tomb, it's like they're racing each other like kids on a playground. Okay? The competition, it's going to get in the way of your love. Uh, the sons of thunder, right? These boisterous, potentially difficult people to deal with, they're in this community. Love each other. Think about Simon and Matthew. Simon's a zealot who wants to incite violence against the Roman oppressors. Matthew was a tax collector who worked for Rome. Love one another. Jesus says, love one another. And he uses interesting language here, a new commandment. Well, what do you mean, Jesus, a new commandment? Like all through scripture, we're called to love each other. What are you talking about? It's new. The word here for new doesn't mean that Jesus is putting something out there that you've never heard before. It is a new lens on ancient truth. And what's the new lens? We're to love just as I have loved you. They've experienced the love of Jesus for the last several years. They've seen him love them even in the midst of their own sin. And Jesus says, you've seen me model this for you. You've experienced my love. Now I want you to love each other. I want you to extend that agape love. A new commandment, a new lens on ancient truth. He gave them a new measuring rod. When you're measuring how well you're loving people, don't use yourself and don't use others. Use Jesus. Just as I have loved you, I want you to love others. A new commandment. And the word here for commandment is connotes a, the, a command given because of the office of the commander. 
And what office does Jesus hold? He's God. <laughs> so he kind of has all authority. A new commandment, an authoritative teaching. Church, this is a commandment over us. We don't get to escape this one. This is not a sermon that we get to say, I didn't really like that one. I'll come back next week and see if I like that. And Jesus said his disciples, he commands them to love as they have experienced his love. Again, we have to experience it before we can extend it. We have to experience it to the, the richness that it overflows in our life and comes out in those external acts of loving the people around us. So I want to ask you, who is it hard for you to love? This is written to disciples of Christ. Who is it difficult for you to love? Probably don't say their name out loud right now. That won't go well for you. But is there a name that comes to mind? Or is there a type of person that comes to mind? Brothers and sisters in Christ are supposed to love one another like this, just as Jesus has loved you. Are you known for your love? And the type of love, again, that Jesus is talking about here is agape love. An unconditional affection, desire for someone's best that leads to self-sacrificial action. So that's how Jesus loved. And that's what we're called to love too. That's how we're called to love too, rather. So are you known for your love? And who is it difficult for you to love? Have gracious curiosity for yourself of those questions. I think that one of the number one reasons we don't live in this way. And there's probably a whole bunch. This is not an exhaustive idea, but I think one of the number one reasons we don't agape love each other is because we have undealt with wounds. And when we don't deal with our wounds, they fester and they grow. They do not diminish. They grow and their power over us grows. And listen, if you've been in the church any amount of time, you've been hurt by the church. That's what it's like living in a broken world with broken people as a broken person. You will be hurt. And those wounds that you've experienced, if you just let them fester, it's going to be very difficult for you to live out the life of love that Jesus has commanded us to live. And so I'd encourage you, you can't stay where you're at. If you've got church hurts and wounds, that's so legitimate. I do too. Sometimes we hurt each other but we need to bring the healing of the healing balm of God's grace. And we need to bring other people into those spaces that can help us process those realities in a healthy way. So who are you going to invite into that space? You cannot stay where you're at. It will impede your ability to, to be a part of the agape love community that Christ has envisioned here. The last thing I want to show is that we're called to be marked by love. Let's look at it again in the passage. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. This is one of those verses for like six weeks. I was like, I kept coming back to the teaching team saying, I don't get it. I don't get it. What is in the world? Have you ever had one of those verses where it's like, what are you talking about here, God? Like, I just don't get it. And eventually after a while, the teaching team helped me see what Jesus is talking about here. He says, all people will know. The people are watching the church. And what do they see? I loved Pastor Craig's illustration last week with the sword. I was glad I got to be in Sutherland in person because I got to see uh, that he almost chopped off his ear a couple times, but he had that sword. And he said, so often the world sees us hacking each other to pieces. They see our divisions, our dissensions, and our differences that we divide over not just theology, but carpet color and ridiculous things. And that's what the world sees. People are watching. And Jesus' vision is that we be this, a community that has love. Agape is the word for one another. What would it look like to be the kind of church that so loved one another that the world looked at it and said, oh my word, I desire to be a part of that. The kind of church where, where zealots love tax collectors. The kind of church where liberals love conservatives. 
The kind of church where Republicans love Democrats, where the older generation loves the younger generation, where city folk and country folk come together under the love of Jesus Christ. What if the church could unify in agape love and be a beacon of hope to the world? Jesus says the world's view of the church hangs on whether or not we love each other. So are you known for your love? Are you known to extend unconditional love to those who are your brothers and sisters in Christ? This is so crucial for the mission of God in the world. And here's why. Any expression of the mission of God that is void of love is not the mission of God. How do I know that? Because God is love. And any expression of the mission of God that is void of love, where we're just beating ourselves over the head with scripture or dividing over needless things is not the mission of God. And it reflects some ugliness to the world. But when we come together in the beauty of an agape community like Jesus envisioned, the church, his disciples in agape, unconditional love for one another, that is a beautiful picture to the world of Christ. That story I told at the beginning of Elwyn Wilson and, and John Lewis, as they sat there in uh, John's office, John stared back at him, question hanging in the air. Will you forgive me for my racist beating of you? John says, yes, I forgive you. Consistent with his character, we've seen all throughout the story, that just like he was forgiving and choosing to love Elwin on the floor of the bus stop rest area, beaten and bloodied. And here's a picture of them after they had reconciled. Forgiveness took place. Because real love has real impact. Real love has real impact. And it impacted Wilson, Elwin Wilson. And it transformed his life. We can have real impact in the world. If we only first receive the love of God. You are loved. And then extend it to all of our brothers and sisters for a world that's watching how does the church treat itself? Is that something I even want to be a part of? As I was reflecting on this story, you and I were much like Elwin. And Jesus, John is much like Jesus. You see, while we were enemies of God, while we hated God, scripture says we hated God, we were enemies of God, we were in rebellion against him. He pursued us in love much like John Lewis forgave Elwin Wilson in love. And Jesus made a way for us to be reconciled with God, to God through the glory of his cross. As we have received that kind of love, we can now obey and, and, and extend the commandment, the new commandment we have to love one another with agape love. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us and sticking around. Um, I just want to walk through a couple questions that we would have gracious curiosity, hold a mirror up to our own hearts and ask ourselves these questions. The first one is, are you known for agape, that unconditional love? Are you known for that? Do you see evidence of that being spread in your home first place with your spouse or your kids? or your parents, and then in your friend circles or the people you work with or the people you go to school with or the, the people with whom you live, work, study, or play, are, are you known for agape love? Jesus wants us to be marked by his love, agape love. And then second question is, how do you respond to people who are difficult for you to agape love? How do you respond to them? I think it's... Uh, uh, true that everybody has someone that they struggle with or a, a certain type of person maybe even that, that you may struggle with. So when you in the church, in brother, sister, Christian community, interact with those people, what are you going to do? 
If you struggle to love them, how will you respond to them in a way that exemplifies your unity in Christ and his love for them? And I'd encourage you, if there is someone that comes to mind in particular, just begin praying, Father, help me to see them the way you do. Jesus, help me to see them with your eyes. Holy Spirit, empower me to love them like Christ loves me. Begin praying for God's strength that he'll provide it. Let's pray. Father God, I lift up just our community at Family Church as we evaluate these difficult questions, God. Help us to not condemn ourselves or shame ourselves. Help us to to exist in your love, to, to live and receive and experience and abide in your love and not reject it. And then from that posture, help us to extend that to the people with whom we live, work, study, or play. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much again for joining us. I love you. Have a good Sunday.